The Lorentz Oscillator Model. This is arguably the most important lecture in this series where we start talking about the Lorentz Oscillator Model. And here I'm just mostly going to talk about generality of resonance. From that, we will derive what is called the Lorentz Oscillator Model, where we'll make an analogy between what's happening at the atomic scale to a mass on a spring. And that's going to explain, it turns out, a lot of phenomenon. First, just a high-level picture of a dielectric response. So there is what's called the single charge radiation model, and this was developed by Heaviside in the late 1800s. And what we're showing on the left is just a, uh, a single charge. It's a positive charge, so we have electric field lines extending outward from that, and that's something that we would learn in electrostatics. Now, what would happen if this charge suddenly changed positions, just slightly, and it shifted its position? Well, what we would see is somewhere a discontinuity in those field lines. And it turns out that discontinuity would travel outward and it would travel outward at the speed of light. So a moving charge generates waves. Here's an animation of that phenomenon. So we see the charge, it changes its position, those electric field lines become discontinuous and that discontinuity travels outwards. And you could even maybe imagine now if that were oscillating, that we would actually have a wave traveling outwards. So now let's think really what's happening with waves and how they interact with materials. So we start off with a dielectric slab. And if we look at this at the atomic scale, what we'll see is a bunch of atoms. And we have nuclei with a positive charge and I'm showing as the red dots and the electron cloud. So the electrons are tiny particles, but they're traveling so fast that they kind of get blurred. And we just think of these electrons as a cloud around the nucleus. And right now, everything's in an equilibrium state. Now we apply an electric field to this medium. And the electric field puts a force on charges. And that has the effect of pushing nuclei in one direction because they have a positive charge and the electrons in another direction because they have a negative charge. So this displaces the electron clouds away from the nuclei. And we get an electric dipole when that happens. Well, like we talked about previously, when we have moving charges, those moving charges radiate waves. Since those displacements are happening at the same frequency as the applied wave, these little tiny waves being re-radiated by all of the atoms are at the same frequency as the applied wave. So they combine with the applied wave out of phase and the interference between the applied wave and all these little secondary waves. And if we average that out, it produces sort of this overall slowing response. And that's why we see waves when they enter a medium, they slow down. And we characterize that with a refractive index. And of course, that's related to the permittivity. And that's where we're heading for all of this. But fundamentally, at the atomic scale, the fields are pushing charges around. Those charges are radiating waves. And those little tiny secondary waves are combining with the applied wave out of phase to produce everything that we see. Now let's talk about resonance. To make it simple, let's talk about something that we can all envision. And let's say we're pushing a child on a swing. And we'll think of this as a low frequency and a high frequency response. Right now, low frequency. So let's say DC. So we literally just take the child and push them up in the air and hold them in the air. Well, at DC, we can say we're certainly able to offset the child the child's not in the sort of the, the center equilibrium position, they're offset. So we are able to drive this. The position of the child is perfectly in phase with the pushing. Uh, it, it almost doesn't even make sense to talk about a phase, but you can imagine just pushing a child super, super slow and everything is in phase. So that's a low frequency response of a resonance. Now we're going to push the child on resonance. So the child on the swing, that's a pendulum system that has a resonant frequency. And whether we know it or not, if we push the child at that frequency, that's how we get the child to go the highest with the least amount of effort. And so we'll push the child when they come back, we push them again. So it just naturally makes us push the child at the resonant frequency. 
But when we push at the resonant frequency, this is when we get the largest amount of displacement. And if we think about this, the displacement is 90 degrees out of phase with our pushing. So when the child's at its maximum, that's not when we're pushing. So 90 degrees out of phase between when we're pushing and when the child's at the maximum. Now imagine a super high frequency. We're trying to push this child at a really, really high frequency. This is not the frequency that the child would naturally go back and forth. And so in fact, the child hardly moves at all, probably going, uh, 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 and that's not good for a child, don't really do this. But anyway, this child is not moving. And what ends up happening when we're pushing above the resonant frequency, the child's displacement is actually 180 degrees out of phase with our pushing. And that's why the child can't move anywhere. It's perfectly opposing. And so very hard to get displacement above the resonance. Now, if we tie all this together, this is what we call the response of a harmonic oscillator. And so if we look at the amplitude, we get our peak amplitude on resonance. We know that that's when it's easiest to push the child. And below resonance at DC, we know we can get a DC offset. Super high frequency, we don't get anything. We can't, we can't push the child at such a high frequency. And then if we look at the phase, in other words, the, the synchronization between our pushing and the child's displacement, well, at DC, we're perfectly in phase. And we said on resonance, we're 90 degrees out of phase. And far above resonance, we're 180 degrees out of phase. That's perfectly opposed and why we can't get any displacement. And so this is typical of any oscillator. And we're going to apply this to what's happening at the atomic scale. And what we'll see after a huge analysis, we'll come back and we'll see this plot again. We can also think of this in terms of the impulse response of a harmonic oscillator. Fundamentally, the time domain is the only thing that's real. When we jump into the frequency domain and do a harmonic analysis, this is sort of a mathematical abstraction, but the impulse response, that is what is real. And so rather than hit a child with a baseball bat, now we're gonna hang a bowling ball from a string. And so if you imagine if you slam that with a baseball bat, that's an impulse response, right? It's not a steady push, it's a single slam. And of course that's gonna get the bowling ball swinging back and forth and it will swing back and forth and the friction will slowly over time make that come to rest. And that is a very typical impulse response. Given all that, let's derive the Lorentz oscillator model. So here's the analogy we're making. On the left, uh, we're showing a, a rigid support on the top. We have some weight on the bottom that's suspended by a spring. And there's a little damper here to provide it some friction. And this will, this will bounce up and down. And because of the friction, it will slowly stop. I'm not showing that. It's just going to continue to bounce up and down. And so that's a resonant system. This is something that we can intuitively picture. Now let's think about what's happening at the atomic scale. Well, we have our positively charged nucleus and we have our electron cloud surrounding around that. And positive negative charge are attracted to each other. So the electron cloud is sort of stuck to this nucleus. But along comes an electric field. And that electric field puts a force on both the nucleus and the electron cloud and it stretches them away from each other. So if that's an oscillating electric field, that displacement is going to oscillate up and down. And we've already seen that that moving charges will radiate waves that'll combine with the applied field and, and so on and so forth. So this is the analogy we're making between the atomic scale model and a mass on a spring. And it's a very, very close and very good analogy. Now what we can do is write an equation of motion thinking of the mass on a spring, but we're really writing this for what's happening at the atomic scale. So the first term here is the acceleration force, and our mass here is the mass of an electron. This R is the displacement distance, so that's position. So of course, the second order derivative of position with respect to time is acceleration. Mass times acceleration is a force. This second force is our frictional force. M again is our mass. And we have this damping rate. This is what's describing the friction or the loss in our system. And now we have a first order derivative of position with respect to time, that is velocity. But overall, the unit of this term is still force. And that's our frictional force characterizing our loss.
we have our restoring force. This is the force of the spring. Or for the atomic scale model, this is the electrostatic attraction between the nucleus and the electron cloud that's keeping it in place. And it is a resonant phenomenon. And so here is our resonant frequency, omega naught squared, and that's multiplying just position. And the last term, this is our exciting force. This is what actually causes the stretching to begin with. And it's really the Lorentz force law. It's charge times the electric field. And the sign here is to enforce our sign convention. But we have a sum of forces here, and that's our equation of motion. We kind of wrote it with the spring and damper model in mind, but really we're writing it for what's happening for a single atom. So we have this time domain equation that we wrote as our equation of motion. The first thing we'll do is Fourier transform this. So we just go term by term and do our Fourier transform. So second order time derivatives become minus j omega to the squared power. First order derivative is a minus j omega to the first power and so on. Then what we'll do is we'll factor out this R term and we sort of have our, our final frequency domain equation. And on the next slide, we will solve this equation for that displacement. Okay, so this is the equation from the previous slide. R is the displacement. So originally the electron cloud is centered around the nucleus, but when it gets stretched, it has a new center and we call that the displacement. So if we solve our equation of motion that we Fourier transform for R, there is our equation describing our harmonic displacement. And we have our driving electric field, we have the charge of the electron, mass of the electron, resonant frequency, frequency, and remember this was our loss term. Now we'll define something called the electric dipole moment. So when we just stretch this electron cloud, we want something to characterize really how strong that displacement is. And there's two pieces of information to that. Well, one, there's the charge involved, right? Even for the same displacement, if there's more charge being displaced, then overall this something is stronger. And of course we can displace it farther, that same something will be stronger. So it makes sense then that the product of these two will give us this electric dipole moment. That's the overall strength of the stretching that has happened. Uh, want to mention right now we're using mu and unfortunately it's a reuse of the greek letter mu for which is also permeability but make no mistake that is not permeability here just a, an unfortunate reuse of that term so we can grab our expression for the displacement r from the previous slide and now we have an expression for this electric dipole moment We're in a good position now to define the Lorentz polarizability. And so we get this electric dipole moment from an applied electric field and sort of this constant of proportionality, if you will, gives us our electric dipole moment. So what is this constant of proportionality? Well, we can go to our previous slide, get the expression for the electric dipole moment, remove the electric field from it, and we end up here now with an expression that's really describing how easily that charge is displaced for the single atom. We're getting near the end of this and we're defining here the polarization per unit volume. When all of these electron clouds are stretched, we call the material polarized, not to be confused with polarization of an electromagnetic wave that's talking more about the orientation of the electric field uh, this is polarization of the material and to make it even more confusing we'll still use a p vector to describe it but those are really two different things polarization of the electric field that's one thing for a later conversation but polarization of the medium is what we're talking about now so what we have to do is we're going to average this mu parameter over the volume and that gives us our overall polarization. And really this is a statistical thing. And that's because not all atoms are perfectly polarized the same way. There's definitely some randomness in this. We sort of squint our eyes, we blur this, and just what is the overall average polarization? So uh, we are averaging this mu parameter, averaging it over the volume and getting this new expression for the polarization per unit volume. 
This N here, that's the number of atoms per unit volume. So think of it as the density. Okay, so our material becomes polarized due to an electric field. We're in a good position now to define the electric susceptibility. This is a measure of how easily it is for an electric field to polarize a medium. And for convenience, we're going to factor out this free space permittivity. That'll become a little more evident why we're doing it this way. And it's really just to give this convenient units. So we define the electric susceptibility that way. We have an expression for our polarization. We simply factor out epsilon naught and E and we can get an expression for the electric susceptibility. It does not contain E. E has to be multiplied in this to give us our material polarization. But here's our expression for the electric susceptibility. And notice we've grouped a bunch of terms together here. These are all just constants. We're going to call this the plasma frequency. We'll, we'll get there. So here is our final expression for the electric susceptibility. And we've grouped all these terms now into what we're calling the plasma frequency. When we talk about the Drude model, we'll talk much more about what this is and what is physically happening, but every material has a plasma frequency. And for right now, it's just a constant stuck at the top of our electric susceptibility equation. Q is the charge of an electron, epsilon naught is the free space permittivity, and ME is the mass of an electron. So we have some notes at the bottom that I just want to take you through. First, this electric susceptibility really is the transfer function of the oscillator system. And that'll have more meaning later on. We talk about like Kramer's chronic relations and some other things. The other thing that we should mention is that we've only really talked about one source of resonance and that's the electron cloud around the atom. And there's actually dozens of different types of resonances that can happen at the atomic scale. Fortunately, all of them can be fit to the Lorentz oscillator model, slightly different parameters, uh, but they can all be fit to that model. So in terms of the equations, we only really have to think of one type of resonance, but there's many, many types. And this was just one that we've considered. Another thing that we've completely ignored is if the locations of the atoms are changing as a function of position, and there's this the statistics involved in that, and that can all influence the susceptibility and the performance of the material. We've completely ignored that. So let's plot this electric susceptibility. And here's what we get. Does this look familiar? Yes, this is the response of a harmonic oscillator. And we plotted something like this that we got by hand waving, talking about the child on a swing. So all of the, the crazy stuff happening here is centered at the resonant frequency that we've chosen to be three in this case. So that's our resonant frequency and pretty obvious by looking at it what the resonant frequency is. The width of the resonance is determined by this term gamma. And here we're only looking at the magnitude of chi, but if we were to look at the magnitude squared, it turns out this gamma would exactly be the full width of half maximum of that. But since we've only plotted the magnitude, not the magnitude squared, it doesn't quite look like that. The, the crossings here are not halfway down. Uh, but gamma is still the bandwidth of the resonance, if you will. And that's also responsible for the loss. If we look at the low frequency response at zero frequency, we see that the magnitude does have a DC value. And we were expecting that from when we talked about the child on a swing. And the phase is zero. Everything's perfectly in phase at low frequencies. And we're able to get a DC offset. At super high frequencies, uh, what we see is that the phase, it's 180 degrees out of phase. So in other words, the displacement is opposing the driving force. And that's why our amplitude is zero at super high frequencies. And on resonance, we can derive a nice equation for the peak amplitude of the susceptibility. And that's the plasma frequency squared divided by the resonant frequency times that damping rate. And the phase exactly on resonance is 90 degrees. And we are also expecting that when we talked about the child on the swing. And this is a very typical response of any resonance.